Phil is an institute professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a member of the Department of Biology and also the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Phil is a former Canada Gairdner International awardee, and he also received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1993 for discovering that uh, genes can be uh, split, meaning that the mRNA that derives from a gene can lack sequences that are present in the gene. Phil has published profusely on the cellular roles of small RNAs and many other types of non-coding RNAs. And his talk today is the origins and functions of non-coding RNAs. I'm going to focus this morning primarily on non-coding RNAs produced in the nucleus. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my overview of what I think they're about and talk about a couple of specific uh, examples. Uh, as Lynn said, we've known for a number of years that uh, a vast majority of the genome is transcribed into RNA. And that came out of primarily the tools to look more deeply at what sequences you can find in cells and culture and in tissue as well. And when you sequence deep and deep enough, and I'm talking about one copy per cell, one copy per 10 cells, one copy per 100 cells, you see RNA from a vast majority of the genome. And about 2% of that RNA, as we know, codes for the R messenger RNA. That represents the 23,000 genes. But the vast majority of the RNA is coming from sequences that are not thought to be coding. And there has been publications that say, if it's transcribed, it's functional. And uh, I think that's a very simplistic and probably incorrect way of looking at biological systems. It's transcribed because it's in the DNA, and the DNA has a lot of sequences that are transposable and deletable, and there's no phenotype associated with them. They are part of the structure in which the gene sequences are encoded and other sequences uh, uh, are present in the genome. And if you look between different species and within the same species, they appear to be under almost no constraint. Now, we do know that a number of uh, non-coding RNAs do have functions. You'll hear uh, later today about excess and others. And so we do know of, of functions in these uh, cells of some non-coding RNAs. But as Lind implied, and I'm going to talk about, the vast majority of this 90% transcription that you see is coming from the process of the transcriptional machinery and how it interacts with the cell uh, and, and produce how it interacts with the DNA. And, and let's talk about that in a moment. Now, as Lynn summarized and illustrated here in this, in this diagram, uh, there are a vast majority of, a vast number of non-coding RNAs that have been proposed to generate endo-siRNAs, and they do exist in, particularly in Drosophila and less so in cells, but you do find small RNAs produced by Dicer from double-strand RNAs. There's a few examples of microRNA sponges where the non-coding RNA is sufficiently at high copy in numbers that they can titrate a functional microRNA. But to, to achieve this, that microRNA sponge has to be at thousands of copies per cell. So it is uh, pretty demanding. It takes a large amount of RNA. And many of the publications out there have no evidence, even though they are centered around the sponge activity, that it is really being mediated through a sponge. Some uh, RNAs are uh, thought to be scaffolds for the interaction of proteins. Again, I'd point out that most proteins are present in cells at thousands of copies per cell. And if you're really going to make a sponge that holds two proteins together or an RNA, you need to have copy numbers comparable. We do know of these nuclear RNAs. This is NEAT1 and MALLET1. They're very abundant. They undoubtedly have some function, but it's still being explored. And the reason that we know so little is we know so little about the structure of the nucleus and how it functions in all these processes. And then there are a number of RNAs that have been posed to be involved in transcription and splicing and other things, but most of that is proposed and not really shown. 
Now, the majority of these RNAs come out of this uh, process called divergent transcription. And uh, John List and uh, my lab discussed this in 2008 and pointed out that if you look with enough sensitivity near the transcriptional start site of most genes, over 95% of the genes in many cells, most cells, you find the polymerase generating RNA, nascent RNA in the gene structure, but you also find polymerase generating RNA in the upstream antisense direction. This represents two pre-initiation complexes producing polymerase in both directions, and it reflects the presence of transcription factors that are bound between these complexes in what is called the nucleosome-free region, which is approximately 300 nucleotides. I think this is a mechanism by which transcription factors encounter an open DNA to allow transcription. So I, I picture upstream of this transcription factors binding. These are very abundant transcription factors, in some cases called pioneers because they can bind to nucleosomes, interact with the DNA, facilitate the binding of Tata binding proteins and pre-initiation complex proteins, giving you then polymerase that, pause, that is stationary and, and forms and then initiates in the gene direction and in, an, and in the antisense direction. And in this complex, these polymerases can be the machines that move the nucleosomes around. After initiation, we know there's pausing of the polymerase something like 50 to 70 nucleotides downstream. Uh, then PTFB needs to work on some negative factors in the carboxy terminal tail of the polymerase to give elongation in the sense direction as well as in the antisense direction. So PTFB does control this process here. So just to give you a feeling how extensive this is, this is a, a result from John Liss's paper. This looks at embryonic, mouse embryonic stem cells and what he's using here is a combination of very sensitive techniques to look at the generation of RNA from DNA sequences. And the technique is called GrowthSeq, where you incorporate bionated nucleotides into elongating RNA. And therefore, you're measuring polymerase bound to DNA and en engaged in elongation. And then coupling that with a cap for GrowthSeq with a cap selection. And you see for most transcriptional start sites, you find the cap. And then in the other sequencing, you find polymerase over about 200 nucleotides downstream. It's paused there. Then it gets a signal for elongation, and it goes on. Well, he found 120,000 of these sites in mouse embryonic stem cells. And about 15,000 of them are at transcriptional start sites, all the genes that are expressed in mouse embryonic stem cells. And what you see if you look at RNA is, this is for the promoters from transcriptional start site, centered on the transcriptional start site center, CAP site. You see RNA in the sense direction, you see RNA in the antisense direction through growth seek, and you see the two nucleosomes. Then if you look at chip data where you're measuring Tata binding protein, you see Tata binding protein in the sense direction and polymerase, and you see it in the antisense direction. And then if you do chip to see if you have transcription factors, you find transcription factors bound between the two polymerases, as in the diagram I showed you in, uh, previously. Now that's about 20,000 promoters. Look over here at enhancers. These are distant sites that we know bind transcription factors and facilitate the activity of proximal genes. And you see RNA in the sense direction and the antisense direction. You see Tata binding protein, you see polymerase, and you see transcription factors. So the sites in which transcription factors are bound to DNA in the nucleus is generating RNA through RNA polymerase. That is the way this system works. And therefore, we should think we should see non-coding RNAs. Well, we're generating all these non-coding RNAs. Is there a general code for why non-coding RNAs are stable, like as they produce a gene, or unstable, like most of the sequences we just talked about? 
And I don't know the answer to that. There will be many answers, undoubtedly, but at least one general answer, which I am really infatuated with, needs to be studied more deeply, is the relationship between the splicing machinery, the code of splicing, and the code of stability of RNA and elongation of polymerase. And the hint that that is uh, a major issue came out of uh, recent work from um, Gideon Dreyfus, which I'll summarize, and then one experiment that illustrates this issue. And then the real question here is a proposal as shown in this diagram that as polymerase is elongating in the sense direction or any other direction and making nascent RNA, that U1 SNRNP, which we know and love because it facilitates the formation of the spliceosome, recognizes RNA and, and suppresses polydentylation. Now you have to remember that polydentylation involves cleavage of the RNA. And once you cleave a nascent RNA, the polymerase will fall off and terminate. And if the RNA is stable, it'll be stable and transported. If not, it'll be degraded. And uh, so the proposal is that as the polymerase moves through the intronic sequences, which are thousands of nucleotides long, U1 binding at proximal sites within a thousand or so nucleotides would suppress polydentylation and you allow the RNA polymerase to continue through the gene. But if this recognition pattern isn't appropriate, distributed, then you'll see cleavage of these sites and you'll get polydentylation and you'll get termination of the transcription and degradation of the RNA. So we did an experiment a couple of years ago to ask how important is this process in the stability of RNA that is involved uh, as polymerase elongates. So what we did was to use a oligonucleotide to inhibit U1 by just complementarity to that N-terminal RNA sequence and then looked at the consequence of that inhibition by using deep sequencing. And what we found uh, and is shown here. Now this is the transcriptional start sites for about 15,000 genes in embryonic stem cells, but it's true in other cells as well as John Liss's study shows. This red line is the uh, sites of polydentylation in the gene direction if you don't inhibit U1, and you see some polydentylation sites being used in the first thousand solar nucleotides in the gene direction. And in the upstream antisense sites, you see more. So this is the upstream antisense polymerase producing RNAs that are being cleaved within the first thousand nucleotides and being degraded by and large uh, and we know that because we can inactivate exo at the exosome and stabilize this RNA tenfold. Now if we inhibit U1, what we see is a vast increase in the polydentylation sites being used in the first thousand nucleotides, telling you that U1's activity is suppressing polyadenylation cleavage as that polymerase is moving along in the gene direction, has no consequence on the upstream antisense telling you that there is a coupling between U1 and elongation of polymerase across the gene. Now, if you look at these polydentylation site distribution across the genome, what you see is, and this has been observed earlier from uh, Lee Hood's Institute on the West Coast, uh, what you see, this is the polydentylation sequence. This is the, the rudimentary core of it, uh, AATAAA and uh, hexamer. And if you look across uh, the genome in a metaplot, aligning genes around the transcriptional start site, these are only genes that are 15 KB or longer because I want to illustrate the intron sequences. That's what most of this is. You see here, you get two copies per uh, kilobase in the intergenic region. You come to the transcriptional start site. It's much less. It's being selected against in the transcriptional start site and it's suppressed through the whole intron and across the whole transcriptional unit. When you come to the three prime end where that sequence is necessary to, put, to produce a poly A, the, it's cleaved. So what I would propose that in this direction, what you see, and then here's the U1 sequence, there's a really strong U1 right downstream. It's known for a long time that the strongest, the most consensus U1 site is right downstream of the transcriptional start site. 
That recognition by U1 as the polymerase initiates and then through the gene is facilitating the suppressing of polydentylation. These sequences are spliced. The RNA is stable. It's transported out of the nucleus by the processes we know, but the sequences, the RNAs coming from this sequence don't have that combination of sequences and are not stable. So we're making lots of RNA from promoters and from enhancers. Does it have function? And uh, that question is still uh, very much open. But one of the, the functions that I am really fascinated about is whether RNA is being used to facilitate the formation of complexes and activities near genes, for example, facilitating the interaction of enhancers. Maybe the enhancer signal is mediated primarily through RNA. Uh, the binding of RNA binding proteins and facilitating the binding of proteins to DNA to form what is the regulatory package that we have known for decades and loved that controls the elongation of polymerase in the sense direction. And I'm going to tell you two stories that come to sort of giving some picture of, of this type of process, I believe. Now, uh, just to point out, I think that these are all cis-acting RNAs. They're not trans-acting RNAs, and they're pictured here as nascent from the polymerase. But I actually suspect, and there's hints throughout the literature, that if these RNAs don't have the appropriate splicing signals, they can be partially stable and remain proximal to the DNA. So uh, this is uh, a study that was, came out of a collaboration with Tyler Jacks, uh, uh, Nadia Dimitrioff, and Jesse Zamudio. And uh, it started earlier than uh, we were involved when John Wren and Eric Lander, in collaboration with Tyler and Nadia leading it, uh, asked if the damage of DNA which activates P53, the most common tumor suppressor gene in cells, um, would facilitate not only the expression of known genes like P21 and back and FAS, but also link RNAs, long intergenic RNAs, that are coming from other sequences non-coding in the genome. And could you identify those and identify uh, a relationship of them with P53? So what they did was damage DNA and did deep sequencing and bioinformatics to uh, identify long intergenic non-coding RNA. And when they did that, uh, this is one of the RNAs they found, uh, link P21. Uh, now the P21 gene uh, you saw in the previous diagram is shown here, and it's involved in cell cycle checkpoint, uh, and is very important for blocking the cycle and allowing DNA damage repair. So it's known to be a critical gene, uh, a tumor suppressor gene. But 20 kb upstream was generated a long non-coding RNA called link P21, which is 1,300 uh, base pairs uh, in length. Um, there's about eight copies per cell. As shown here, it's spliced and polyadenylated and capped. Looks like a message. And uh, it has no open reading frame. And it's a direct target of activation by P53. As shown here, P53 is known by ChIP-seq to bind here and bind here. So what's this long non-coding RNA being generated at eight copies per cell uh, upstream of P21? That's after activation of P53, before it's about one-tenth that number. Uh, and uh, I'll show you two slides that uh, illustrate, I think, uh, some of the uh, activities of this P21 link RNA. So what Tyler and Nadia did was to put uh, lock P sites around the promoter and then introduce Cre and delete this promoter. And uh, if you do that, you lose the expression of uh, this link P21 RNA. And what is shown over here is in the presence of link P21, the expression of the message from P21 here, and what you see is in the absence of DNA damage, it's set at one. In the presence, it goes up threefold. But if you delete this sequence and that RNA is not expressed anymore, you get a decrease of about twofold in the level of P21, and you get a, a decrease upon P53 activation. 
So this looks like an enhancer, smells like an enhancer 20 kb away from a gene that it's regulating, and you delete the sequence, and it reduces the level of RNA. So uh, they also showed, and just I haven't gone through this, that this uh, activity on P21 is in cis, not in trans. So it doesn't work across to the other allele, it only works on the chromosome. So that again would be consistent with it being an enhancer. So why isn't this just an enhancer and this RNA is fortuitous? And what they did was then to use antisense oligos to inactivate the RNA in the nucleus. They did two, I'll only show you data from one. And what the, they observe is shown here that uh, in the ASO control, they've set this to one. This is P21 link, this is P21, both are set to one. This is in, uh, with the expressed RNA, you add the ASO, you reduce the lead P21 link RNA by about tenfold, and you reduce P21 by about 30%. It, it looks like it's reducing through mediated through RNA. As a control, if you delete P21 link, so that same ASO now has no target here, you've only deleted these sequences there, DNA sequences there, but what you see is no effect. So this is then, looks like an RNA mediating an effect in cis, 20 kb away, and the phenotypes one sees in mouse amyral fibroblasts due to this deletion here can be related to P21 reduction. So P21 link is an activator of a gene expression. It looks like an enhancer. Uh, it promotes transcription in cyst of P21, and the phenotypes of the deletion of P21 link can be attributed to its role in P21. So that would suggest that the RNA coming from here is in some way facilitating probably the binding P53, but it could be other mechanisms, activation of P21, and that link RNA is working in cis, in this cell. Now in a second, and this is again a collaborator with, a collaboration with uh, Rick Young, uh, and this is Alice Zagopia, uh, who's really done uh, uh, yeoman's work here, uh, asked the question, well, we have this nascent RNA, could it be facilitating activity local to the site of that nascent RNA being generated in cells? And as I've already told you, uh, we find these nascent RNAs in the sense and any sense direction from transcriptional start sites and from enhancers and many other people have reported enhancer RNAs and as I showed you in the first slide, if you look sensitive enough, most RNA enhancers produce some RNA. So the question is, well, could that RNA be facilitating the binding of DNA binding factors to localized sequences? So polymerase being nearby, producing an RNA, may facilitate the binding of a DNA binding factor to specific sequences exposed in the nucleosome free region and be a forward feedback process. Make a little RNA, facilitate the binding of more factors, and accumulate then the transcriptional machinery. Well, we know from uh, many studies for many years that YY1 is a DNA binding factor and there's evidence from Jeannie Lee's work, who you will hear later today, that YY1 also binds to RNA. So what is YY1? It's a yin-yang factor. Uh, it is a, a zinc-coordinated DNA binding transcription factor, expressed ubiquitously in mammalian cells. It's got key roles in development and tumor genicity. And it has been shown, as I said before, from Jeannie Lee and others, that it binds to excess RNA sequences uh, in vitro. So what uh, they did was to compare a chip seek of the binding sites of YY1. This is where you take an antibody to YY1 and fragment the DNA and ask what DNA sequences it's bound to. And what you see, for example, here in ARID1 is that it's bound at the transcriptional start site. And up here at an enhancer for ARID1, it's bound at the enhancer site. 
And then they do a clip seek, and that's where you UV radiate cells before you open them. So you're looking at what we think is primarily endogenous binding and cross-link the protein to RNA and then pull out the protein and map the site of cross-link. And what you see is cross-linking two RNA sequences at YY1 right downstream of the transcriptional start site. And you find enhanced cross-linking at the enhancer, where we've talked about having nascent RNA in both conditions, in both places. So then they, uh, Allah took a purified YY1 and showed it bound to DNA and bound to RNA. The binding affinity to DNA is about threefold higher, still nanomolar, but threefold higher than to RNA, but it binds to both DNA and RNA. The sequence specificity is very limited. It's uh, shown on the previous slide about three nucleotides biased towards a certain sequence. Then here's a really interesting experiment. This, this is a, a, because of the many things, this is an interesting experiment. So the question then is, does the presence of the RNA facilitate the binding of this DNA binding factor to DNA sequences? And how could you test that? Well, all a, set out to use this CRISPR system, and this is DCAS9, which we'll learn later in the afternoon, is a toothless uh, CRISPR system that doesn't cleave DNA, but it has all the DNA binding properties, properties guided by a guide RNA. And what she did was to use that system to target uh, the RNA to specific sites on the genome and to target that RNA and ask if you fuse a sequence, this is from ARIAD1, which we know has an eye clip, to that system, could you facilitate the binding of YY1 to its binding site immediately adjacent to the targeted sequence? So here shows you uh, the fold uh, YY1 binding by uh, ChIP-seq type technology. This is the control when you're targeting a, the RNA without this longer piece of about 60 nucleotides of RNA, you get this much chip seek set to one of YY1. But then when you do the same CRISPR system, same level with the additional RNA, you go up about 50%. So that would argue this RNA being localized here would facilitate YY1 binding. Now over here in the same cell, there's another YY1 binding site this is what we're going to target with CRISPR, but that's the internal control, and what you see is when you target this here and get a 50% increase, you get no change there. So that's an internal control. Well, you do that at six different sites. So uh, you target to uh, uh, SUSE 12, e, uh, E2F3, and six other sites using three of the other sites is the same type of control, and in all six cases, when you target this RNA sequence to the site, you see enhanced binding of YY1. Not a big signal, but a really consistent signal outside statistical error. But uh, that suggests that this non-coding RNA, uh, and probably many others that YY1 crosslinks to in the ChIP-seq, what could be happening is that polymerase is producing this nascent RNA. The RNA is interacting with YY1 and other, and, and, and YY1 is binding to DNA, but this multivalency facilitates the binding of YY1 here as compared to other sites without RNA mediating its effect. And that positive cooperativity of RNA being generated, binding DNA binding factors that produce enhanced binding that have produced RNA and produces more RNA and enhanced binding could be a feed-forward system that's important in the organization of many of the transcriptional sites and the enhancer sites. There are undoubtedly other things going on, but this is a, 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 a clear example of one possibility, and there's clear evidence that over 20 uh, transcription factors uh, I do have RNA binding specificity. 
in addition to DNA binding specificity. And this doesn't have to be direct. We could have a transcription factor bound to an RNA complex, RNA protein binding complex, and get the same type of interaction. So what I've tried to argue in my presentation is that there's lots of transcription going on. It is the result of the transcriptional machinery and how it works in cells. And these non-coding RNAs can have many functions facilitating what looks like an enhancer activity and facilitating the binding of DNA binding factors. And there's undoubtedly many other functions which you'll hear about today. So I'd like to thank the people who did this work. In my lab, it was uh, Jesse Zamudio. Uh, Zubing did the, the U1 uh, work with an undergrad, wonderful one, uh, Andrea Chris. Um, and uh, I undoubtedly have other people here who have contributed to this. I thank them and I thank you and we're really a fertile group. This is my research group down at the Cape. Thank you very much. The question is, uh, how much specificity, I'll rephrase it, how much specificity is, in, uh, is there in that RNA? And the binding specificity of Y by 1 for RNA has limited specificity. There is a bias to it, but it is really limited. So if you took a long enough RNA from any sequence, I think you would have those nucleotides there and facilitate the binding. So, uh, and I think that's true of most of these types of interactions. Very low sequence specificity, but probably physical proximity is a, is a major part of the, uh, the process. Okay, last question. Uh, uh, wonderful talk. Just uh, one quick question. So you, uh, you were talking about some monocoding RNAs that are localized in the nucleus, some of them in the cytoplasm. Have you guys ever seen uh, this localization of, of some lone occurring RNAs depending on, uh, I don't know, cancer or uh, cell cycle regulation or something like that? Oh. Like the, some nuclear going to the cytoplasm? Uh, they're, they're, the whole field of non-coding, long non-coding RNAs is only four, three or four years old from you know, the initial discovery. Uh, and I would be amazed if we do not find out of, you know, 100,000 different RNAs being generated, that some will be specific to, okay, specific to location and specific to some functions. I, I want to say one thing, though. The biggest, most common, uh, let's say, most common change you see in cancer and between cell types is the diversity of enhancers that are used. So we know most of the regulation specificity is being seen in the cell through enhancers being activated and controlling genes. So we're gonna see non-coding RNAs shift around just like we have known for a long time that enhancers in different cell types and in different conditions shift around. So I think there's going to be a lot of diversity in non-coding RNAs that are the product of this, this movement of regulatory activities from different enhancers. <laughs>